Aloha. Welcome to American Issues, Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Today's topic and title is Trump's Speech, Words of Bloodbath. Uh, maybe a lot of you have recently seen the media coverage of Trump's uh, speech at Vandala, Ohio, his uh, campaign rally. And uh, it was quite disturbing for those that uh, remember January 6th and remember how Donald Trump uh, stochastically puts sentences together that imply the use of violence if, if he doesn't get his way. And I'm going to read a direct quote from that, that, that rally speech. We're going to put a 100% tariff on every single car that comes across the line. And you're not going to be able to sell those cars if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country, and that'll be the least of it. Now, critics say that, oh, you know, you can't look at those words because you're not putting it in the proper context of the audio industry. Well, we're going to talk about the context of his speech and put it in proper context. And with me today to do that is my, my co-host, Jay Fidel, and our special esteemed guest, Luis Ng, partner of Denton's Law Firm. Luis, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to be a special guest here today. We appreciate it. And uh, Jay, of course, always thank you for, for helping me out in this show. So Jay, to you first. Uh, those, of course, who defend Donald Trump said, hey, why are you looking at this, con this, this, this quotation about creating a bloodbath if he's not elected and you're not using it in the context of uh, his comments to um, the president of China about auto industry manufacturing in Mexico? Uh, you, you've heard the quote. Uh, do you remember what he said at the beginning of his, of his speech in his rally, by chance? No, tell me. Well, he began because he was on stage. And again, before anything starts, he, he's wearing his red MAGA hat. And then you hear the chorus um, through technology means, and it's been done before on his stage rallies, is the chorus of the national anthem sung by each prisoner, convicted prisoner, of the January, January 6th insurrection. So behind the background of that music, or those sing, um, a cappella singing, is Donald Trump reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. So that's the context. Um, that's part of the context. And then throughout his speech, he starts to talk about immigration and how the, um, the immigrants are, you know, quote unquote, they're animals. Uh, recall that in a previous speech, he called them vermin. Uh, this is stuff out of 1934 Germany. So that's basically how he starts off uh, his, his rally. He also um, refers to the January 6th convicted, convicted felons as hostages and how they're great patriots. So what he's doing is he's whipping his audience into this agreement or this, this cabal that um, there's the assumption that they're patriots, they're hostages, and he promises uh, them pardons on the first day he's elected president of the United States for a second term. So that's the beginning of the context. Uh, your thoughts about his bloodbath comments? You know, it seems like it's just one word, but there's much more here. Um, we've been talking here on American Issues for a, a year or two about stochastic speech and trying to figure out exactly how that works. Um, and in a word, it seems to me that stochastic speech is a, a message, a coded message to his base, actually asking them to do something, giving them license to do something. And so when he says bloodbath, it follows right along. Uh, with all his, um, you know, remarks that he made on January 6th. Um, and um, it is the same kind of thing where he is asking them um, to do something. And that means to have a bloody event, whether it's in the, the national capital or in the streets. And clearly, to me, you know, just my look at the English language, and I think most people, to see what Louise has to say, um, you know, I would interpret all of that to be directed at if he doesn't win, there'll be 
um, you know, a bloodbath. That's what he's really saying. That's that's the stochastic message that he's portraying. I don't think there's any confusion about it, but remember that demagogues use words that are emotionally charged. They throw them in, you know, to whatever they're saying. Um, and they want to get an emotional reaction. They're talking to you really on two levels or more um, just to evoke some kind of emotional reaction and action. And that's exactly what he's doing here now. And I don't think that he truly intended to make this speech about bloodbaths. I think that's just him. That's the way he is. And it's a window into his thought process. It's a window into what he really wants. And, you know, so fundamentally, at some level of his consciousness, he wants a bloodbath. He's planning a bloodbath. Um, and he found a way to use that word, to find a word and use that word um, to motivate his base or the people he thinks are listening to him. Um, it's, it's very scary because, A, he means it, and B, they're listening, and C, they're probably moved to action. And I guess ultimately the question is whether the message is loud and clear enough, and I think it is loud and clear enough, um, and B, uh, whether these days, after 1,200 people have been tried and convicted and sent to jail over January 6th, whether they will have a the motivation um, to respond in, in violence. But there's no question he's calling for violence, and he's not calling for violence about cars. Um, nobody could interpret it that way. But as a demagogue, you know, he throws that word on the fire all by itself. It's enough to send a stochastic message. Right. And, you know, you're right. We've talked about this uh, for a couple of years now. And you know, the First Amendment is, has a dividing line, and that is uh, words that are used to promote violence. Unfortunately, um, that First Amendment right seems to be, the dividing point seems to be whether speech is used for immediate violence that occurs after the speech is given, or as, as we bring up, that stochastic speech is used, there's an implied use of violence, and maybe the event happens months, weeks, uh, you know, later. Therefore, the speech itself was not deemed to be inappropriate because violence didn't occur immediately after the words were spoken. So well, the first, the first Amendment really, you know, hasn't been it hasn't been interpreted to include this kind of thing. And maybe Trump will change that. Maybe something is going to happen here where uh, the courts are going to have to figure out that if he's evoking violence predictably, where you and me and Louise, we can all figure out what he's really trying to do and then see that he does it. Um, you know, that that should not be protected speech. Mm -hmm. I want to add also that implicit in the use of the word bloodbath, just as on January 6th, he is saying, I'll be there with you. I'm planning something. It's not just you. It's us. It's us against the, you know, the deep state, the government, what have you. It's, it's us making a real mess. Um, and, and I think the implication, especially in the context of what happened on January 6th, is that uh, he's organizing something. He's got a plan, and he wants you to join the plan for a bloodbath. We're going to do it together. Mm -hmm. Well, I, let's also emphasize the fact that you said, if I'm not elected, there will be a bloodbath. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the important part. And also, um, if you look at the words during that, what I, the quotation is, he said, that's going to be the least of it. He said that two times, um, meaning that this tariff against cars will be the least of the issues. It's the bloodbath that's going to take priority. So you have to look at those, that one sentence, is, that's going to be the least of it. Um, also, during the rally, before this, this quotation was, was brought up on the stage by Donald Trump, he went into the fake election uh, routine. Um, fake election that it was, was a quotation. It's a rigged election. You'll fight a crooked election, that they, then they indict you. Uh, the radical left Democrats rigged the presidential election in 2020. That's not going to happen in 2024. That's not going to happen ever again. So, you know, you basically have him whipping up the crowd uh, over a, a number of um, motifs, if you will. Um, immigration and their animals and their vermin. Um, the fake election, um, you know, getting them whipped up and to agree that uh, only Donald Trump 
can fix it. Fix all the problems in the country. And, you know, his rallies last for an hour and a half, and I think most of it is not on script. I don't think he uses the teleprompter all that much on some of these rallies. So um, the, you're right. The bloodbath probably was not in his teleprompter speech. It comes out naturally for him. And when he uses it, uh, his staff have to try to get him out of the trouble that he created. So, um, Luis, uh, your comments about Donald Trump's quotation, the use of bloodbath if he's not uh, elected president again, and your general impression of where we are in this campaign with Donald Trump and the, the motifs he brings up to the stage. It's, he is um, a troubling personality. And what I'm troubled by is that he seems to appeal to so many people who are not seeing the fact that um, this is a man who egged on the, the crowd in January 6th and then kind of abandoned them. He did not join them. Um, he's not with them. All these people have been convicted because he, um, you know, egged them on and then backed off to save himself. And these folks that follow him don't seem to realize that he's just as willing to throw them under the bus as anybody else. That said, I find his words very concerning. And Tim, as I had mentioned to you before, um, and as you have said, it just seems like he's just taken a page out of the playbook of Mein Kampf and, and the rise of Nazism and Hitlerism. And it had reminded me of a trip to Berlin that we took in the summer and seeing some of the museum displays about the rise of Nazism and terrorism, which were just too, um, too much in parallel with what Trump and his cronies seem to be doing. Well, can you mention a couple of those parallels? Sure, I, I will. And um, the ones that really stuck out for me was one, there was a big poster. This is in um, a museum called the Topography of Terror. And it's um, built on the grounds of what was once the SS headquarters. And so now it's sort of like this, it looks kind of like post hell, you know, <laughs> very, very um, desolate land, but there's this very stark building in the middle and it's part of it is a museum part of it is a meeting and learning center. But um, one of the posters talked about how Hitler consolidated power in the executive. That's how he you know, started his rise to power. And days before that, there had been an article in the New York Times about how Trump and his cronies had already um, laid plans to consolidate power in the White House if he was uh, elected. So concern number one. Um, next poster comes along and, you know, they talk about how you find scapegoats, you, um, you know, you create um, uh, people to be against or issues to be against. And they targeted gays. They targeted um, abortion as things to, you know, that were against the values of the state and, you know, justified persecution and hate. Um, and then, of course, there were the posters covering um, the persecution of Jews and the Holocaust, and why didn't Germans rise up against um, that those horrors? And one of the explanations was that Hitler and his group had made people economically comfortable. They felt they were in a good economic situation. So, you know, why should they worry about what else was going on and human rights violations if they were comfortable themselves? Um, so it was all in all, it was just too disturbingly um, similar to what was going on here. You know, it's interesting you mentioned economic prosperity for the Germans, and that was in the museum. Uh, recently, we had General um, Kelly, um, Donald Trump's uh, chief advisor, uh, chief of staff, actually, uh, the first one. And uh, Donald Trump um, is reported from General Kelly that he said Hitler did a lot of good things. And Kelly said, specifically what? And he said, well, he, he, he improved the economy, uh, greatly improved the economy. And then Gen uh, General Kelly's remark was, yeah, he did, but he used it against his own people and against the world. Uh, you can never say anything good about Hitler. <laughs> I'm sure that enraged Donald Trump at the time. Uh, so thank you for bringing those points up. And I, I think that we have to kind of view Donald Trump's speeches from here on in, in context of what was happening, what was said, the methodology of what was said in, in Germany in 1934, 1935, leading up to 1938. Uh, what you mentioned in your, the points that you brought was, one, uh, some of the classic techniques of propaganda. Scapegoating is a classic technique. Uh, the big lie, of course, is. But also uh, the fascist roadmap to power. 
and that is consolidation of of or, the, your agencies that you know work under you and um, their their loyalty is not to the mission uh, or to the constitution in this country or the or rule of law. Their mission is to loyalty to one and one only individual, and that would be Donald Trump. So, um, Luis, thank you so much for for bringing that to the table. Appreciate it. Uh, Jay, you know, Timothy Snyder, who is a history professor at Yale, um, looked at this speech, looked at this rally, uh, pointed out the, the true context of it, particularly in the beginning of uh, calling the January 6th convicted felons, uh, patriots, um, hostages, and how he was going to pardon them because they've been badly mistreated. Uh, but he, one of the things he said, and I want to get your, your opinion on this, is he said, the media needs to start covering these rallies uh, more intently, carefully, and just listen and listen to the words that he's using. You know, back seven years ago, when we, we did um, Trump Week, and we said that Donald Trump's getting too much airtime, too much media time. And um, Timothy Snyder seems to be suggesting just the opposite. Your thoughts about media coverage at his rallies and the horrible things he says— um, is that a is that a distraction, which we used to call it, a distraction to get the, the the people's attention away from the issues that Donald Trump's trying to accomplish, or is it something that we need that um, the alarm bells to go off on because of his words that he uses at these rallies? That is such a good question. I, I compliment you on that question and that apparent conflict. Uh, and yes, Louise, Tim, and I talked about that for years about how we should ignore the remarks that Trump made is just healthier exactly. not, to, not to listen because he was so nutcakes. Um, and, and that was the right thing for a long time. And arguably, it's still the right thing because uh, Trump occupies uh, you know, the media every day, every show, every segment. He's there. Mm -hmm. He's there in, in all the newsletters I get. And you know, he is the talk of the town. He always wanted to be that. And if there's one benefit for him over these past few years, it's been he is the talk of the town, the talk of the world, even. And so, you know, you say to yourself, gee, I, I don't want to hear it anymore. I can't stand it because I know he's lying. I know he's trying to hurt people. Um, and he's trying to appeal to something in, in the human condition, which is best defined in German, which is the word schadenfreude, you know, enjoyment of the misfortune of others. It's like scapegoating. It's part of the same thing. And so, you know, I, I don't want to hear it. On the other hand, I take Tim Snyder pretty seriously. Uh, he is really a, you know, a philosopher king as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> and he does raise an issue, and you raise an issue, Tim, that we should consider. We need to parse the language. Mm -hmm. We need to see exactly what he's saying and what he's trying to do. Um, it'll be a wild time. What does that mean? You know, um, I'll be with you. What does that mean? Um, all kinds of implications. And although Trump did not do well at the University of Pennsylvania, and you know, my understanding is his father jimmied his grades over there somehow. Um, he was afraid to actually publicize his grades because he didn't do very well. In fact, he might not have been able to stay at University at Wharton. Was it? Um, without his father's intercession, uh, I doubt that he really read Mein Kampf. I doubt that he has an intellectual turn on this. I think it's it's him, uh, and he's like um, you know special talent. Um, uh, what what was the fellow in Rain Man, Dustin Hoffman? What was that called? <clears throat> oh, you remember? Idiot savant? It, it's like savant. an idiot savant. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> that that's what it is. I mean, down deep, without reading Mein Kampf, he understands the um, the process of consolidating power. He understands the process of compromising, corrupting everything around him, of making it transit transit uh, transactional. And um, this is not something he read or studied or has any real philosophy about. It's just deep inside him. He's an idiot savant and. That's his strength. Um, and so, I, you know, I think when he comes up with these words uh, and these stochastic remarks, it comes from that part of him. Um, so, uh, and I feel we do have to watch what he says. We do have to parse it because we have to try to understand how his base is taking this. 
And we have to try to countermand that somehow. The media has to countermand the message that he's sending. And we can't do that unless we listen carefully and parse it word for word, like we're doing now with the word bloodbath. But so Jay, I think I, Tim Snyder is right. Jay, I would also think that as much as he may be the idiot savant who just has a dictator frame of mind, there are people behind him who are perhaps smarter and more calculated who are also supporting um, this march to um, dictatorship. Well, I, I think totally I'm, agree. Great but point. That's, that's part of being what he is. Part of being what he is is to round him, surround himself with people who are corruptible. And, you know, the, the funny thing is you say, wow, oh, these guys, they have great credentials. They're around him in the White House. People in the White House must know a few things or two. They must have some leadership qualities. They must be moral. No. If you are an idiot savant um, autocratic leader, uh, you don't want good people around you. You want corruptible people around you. And I think I go in with the assumption that everybody he selects for any job he believes is corruptible. Good point. And Luis, you bring up an excellent point about the people around him. I think of Mitch McConnell, <laughs> who couldn't stand Donald Trump, but found him to be useful. I think of Putin, uh, who looks at Trump and thinks he's, what do they call him? A useful idiot. So uh, the word idiot comes up in a couple contexts here. And I think Donald Trump, although he's, you know, maniacal genius on, on how he can persuade people and, and get them to believe and follow whatever he says and does, um, he's really all that, not that bright. But yet uh, those around him think they can control him and therefore get what they want from him. So there goes, there's half the problem. That's why I think you have a lot of Republicans who are either scared to speak up or um, find them still useful uh, to carry their water. So. Thank you, uh, Luis, for bringing up that point. I wanted to bring up also, you know, <clears throat> his defenders say that, you know, the, the Democrats, the, you know, the libtard, um, they have Trump derangement syndrome for whatever Donald Trump says, they take in the wrong way and they just uh, can't help themselves to criticize Trump and make a, make a big issue of terms like bloodbath or I'll be a dictator for a day. Um, are his defenders right? Are, are, are Democrats and some independents and some Republicans uh, uber sensitive to Donald Trump's words and we, we take the ball down the field far too fast? Or are we correct that Donald Trump speaks his mind, he tells us his game plan openly, and uh, we're right to call it out? Your thoughts on that, Louise? I think we're right to call it out. I mean, I did, I agree with you. At the beginning, I thought the media is paying too much attention to him. Well, in a way they are. Are they, and they're paying too much attention to the wrong things. Uh, you know, we see people trying to correct the course in editorials and the like. But um, I, you know, I do think he's, we do need to pay attention. Um, people perhaps weren't taking folks like Hitler and others seriously enough. Um, and we need to be able to, uh, you know, fight back and and just remind people what this democracy is about, what made America great, which is diversity and immigration. Um, you know, come back with some with the positives. Um, interestingly, at dinner last night with some folks that are were, are are not American, they're from Australia, just talking about the extremism in our country. How did it arise? Um, and you know, what is going to happen in the next election? And I think that a lot of people are just looking on going, what is going on in America? And it can, can Americans really be that stupid to elect him again? And I hope this time we're there, you know, we don't have enough deranged people who will elect this man because he will be more dangerous this time because he's probably learned his lesson or those around him have learned his lesson and are going to figure out how to get things done this time. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so we've had a good seven years of Donald Trump's speech on the media almost every day. Um, and Jay, you and I, you might recall this too, that um, there comes a point where your, your listening audience becomes desensitized because it's every day. It's, some of the things are repeated over and over again. Um, I'm reminded when Donald Trump first started his campaign, and he basically referred to John McCain, who was a war veteran hero because— he, he fought bravely, and he was captured in, you know, captured in Vietnam. And Donald Trump proudly boasted that John McCain's no hero. 
my heroes are, are people who are thrown in, in, in or captured. Um, then fast forward, I mean, that created quite a stir. There was a lot of veterans very upset with that. Then fast forward when he's president of the United States, and as reported by John Kelly and confirmed by uh, John Kelly, General John Kelly, that uh, it was his quotations that the dead veterans in World War I grave sites in Europe and gr World War II were suckers and losers. Um, hardly a peep from the veterans organizations, hardly a peep that people were aghast by Donald Trump referring to our dead veterans, our heroes, uh, as suckers and losers. So is there the effect of desensitization desensitizing the, the listening population of America, and that's how he gets away with it? Are we desensitized? Mm. Another great question, Tim. Um, I, well, I think in, in large part, a lot of people are. They can't hear it anymore. Uh, I've heard that. I'm not going to respond to it. I don't care about it. I'm going to lead my life without thinking about it. Um, we, however, the three of us and other people we know, we, we do care about it. And we want to know what's going on. We want to follow what's going on. Well, let's talk for a moment about pathology, about uh, psychopath-type pathology. Um, I, I personally, I treat uh, Trump as a, as a, as a, a very sick man and um, a, a psychopath, if you will. And I think that kind of pathology includes the notion that you test the boundaries. You always test the boundaries. And if you, can, if you think you can get away with it, then you do it. If there's pushback, maybe you reconsider. Uh, and so I think that, you know, there's a story of that kind of uh, sign curve for a lot of the things that he's suggested and done. Um, in other words, he comes up with something completely ridiculous and he gets pushback, maybe he backs off. Maybe he backs off on his own motion or he backs off because his, uh, his staff has said, hey, Donald, you really can't say that and do that. Of course, the number of people on his staff that would uh, ask him to push back is going to decline dramatically if he's, if he's in office again. They won't control him. There will be no guardrails. And as uh, Luis suggested, he knows the story. He knows how to push it around uh, so that nobody can stop him. Um, second time around, it'll be worse for sure. But in the way of psychopaths, uh, if he finds this pushback, at least he will consider not doing it. So you start out with the assumption that he, he really means what he says. This is him. This is that certain level of consciousness that says, yeah, we're going to have a bloodbath, and uh, I'll be there, and I want you to be there, and I want, to, I want there to be blood in the street, uh, and all for me, that I will uh, clothe that in patriotism, in the star-spangled banner draped in the American flag and the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, which is really devotion to Trump, you know. And so uh, I guess what, what I'm saying is um, that the press needs to cover this. The press needs to watch every word and to figure out how that affects the base, the base who, you know, are the objects of, uh, of schadenfreude, or the subjects of schadenfreude, the base who would like to see the country destroyed, even if it means they will be destroyed. It's a strange. Uh, Jim, what's his name? Jim Jones with the with, with the um, <clears throat> Kool Aid. You know they Guyana. they Guyana. They don't mind drinking the Kool Aid because it's really important to destroy everything. It gives them a kind of pleasure <clears throat> to destroy everything. So they they drink the Kool Aid and destroy themselves too. And he's asking him to do that. <clears throat> Does he mean it? It's a big question. Does he mean it? Will he do it on day one? And I want to address that in a minute. Will he do it on day one, or is he waiting, testing? For, for pushback. And if the media pushes back, he is less likely to do it. If the media treats it as old news and they ignore it um, and they don't push back, it's more likely that he will do it. On the day one thing, remember what he said. Uh, they, they said, will you be an autocrat? And he said, only on day one. Only. The word only. I said, that was a twist of phrase. Remember you know, although he's an idiot savant, he knows how to play with the language always, even when he was in real estate, maybe especially in real estate. Uh, he's really a, a kind of interesting uh, exemplar of the real estate industry in New York City. <clears throat> but anyway, so uh, when he says um, bloodbath, 
Um, what are they going to do? And, and what is he going to do on day one? I suggest to you what he really meant was, I am going to make the United States an autocracy on day one. After that, there won't be an issue. Yeah, he, he actually mentioned the fact that there won't be any uh, elections, basically, if he's not reelected. <laughs> so he said that in his uh, Ohio speech. Um, Luis, your final thoughts. I, I guess I just want to mention it seems to be in 2016, 2017, when Tr Donald Trump was throwing his hat in the ring. The media was, for lack of a better word, uh, mesmerized. I mean, here was this new phenomena that broke all the norms about how to act as a presidential candidate. And um, I, I think the media was either naive, uh, maybe there's a lot of young reporters, but it seemed to be a, a complete mesmerization of, of Donald Trump and how his coverage uh, took place. Is the media a little more savvy, a little more knowledgeable? Do you think they uh, catch on to the nuances of his words and cover this better than they did back in 2017, 2016? I think it yeah, it depends on which media you're talking about. Um, I I think that there is. I, I think we have more commentators, and we need to be. Uh, you know, and we need to just foster the critical thinkers, and the media that are calling him out on these things. Um, and, and you know, folks like Heather Cox Richardson, the professor who writes current analyses tying to history. I think we need to pay attention to that. I think we need to support groups who are looking. You know. Of, finding ways to get voters out and educate. Um, it's not just the media, it's education too. It's, you know, trying to get voters out um, and, and educating them that we need to do to prepare for this next election. Okay. You know, we've run out of time. So Luis, I'm going to go to you for your final thoughts on this topic or anything else. Well, my final thought is that everybody should be, they should be reading the news as well as reading the commentary behind the news and reading, going for the more balanced media. Um, obviously, that, that's my personal view, but I think, you know, NPR, New York Times, Washington Post, those are the ones I follow um, because they will, they will just be more analytical and try to get to the truth. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Jay, you get the last word on this topic. Yeah, I read the New York Times or the Washington Post. Um, but sometimes I feel that I'm in a minority group of reading the Washington Post and the New York Times because the people in the in the red bubble are not reading it, would never read it. I ran into a guy at a, at a, at a, at a social one time, and I mentioned an article in the New York Times. He said, the New York Times? I would never read the New York Times. Really? It's the leading newspaper of record in the country. No, I would never read the New York Times. So what you have is a large number of people, maybe tens of millions or more, who would never read the New York Times. They consider it um, the, the other bubble. So I'm concerned about that. And my final comment to you guys is that um, this doesn't happen. It doesn't you know, come up because we say that people should educate themselves. The teachers in the schools are not going to do that, honestly. Um, the teachers in, in the colleges, I don't know. I really don't know. I haven't been to college in a long time. Um, but, you know, uh, it ultimately, in a practical way, it depends on the Democratic Party. For Trump's negative leadership, for his disastrous, vicious, cruel, idiot savant leadership, <clears throat> uh, you've got to countermand that. And the Democrat, it falls on the Democratic Party as a consolidated political group, a national group, to respond to that. And I guess that means Biden, but it also means the party in general. I get emails from 50 candidates in 50 states. They all want some money from me. They think I'm going to save them. Not. You've got to have a voice, or at least a, a, a limited number of leadership voices that come out there and, and countermand everything that Trump says, uh, which is autocratic. And I think that is the solution, but I am not confident that it will be reached. I want to thank you for that comment. I'd like to echo it. And um, also just add, let's not forget the independents, our devoted independents of this country, because we'll surely need their votes come November 2024. Uh, I'd like to thank Jay Fidel. I'd like to add one other thing which we haven't discussed here, and that is Trump is certifiably crazy. 
And it's, it's, I don't know whether it's, um, you know, uh, uh, dementia or some kind of neurological issue, or he's just crazy. Maybe it's well, both. Well, but Mary Trump line, wrote, Yeah, right. Exactly. Mary Trump wrote a book. She had direct observation, years of observation, mm -hmm. and she's a clinical psychologist. Mm -hmm. So she had some, uh, some skin in the game. She had some credibility in writing of that book. And maybe that book should be dusted off. She wrote it some years ago. Uh, time to dust that book off and, and, and look at it again. Good point. So if you've been close to these kinds of diseases and this kind of dementia process, and some of us have, you know, with relatives and friends and all that, um, fact is, it gets worse. And we have, what, seven or eight months to go before the election, eight months, whatever. Um, <clears throat> it's, there's a fair chance that if Trump is, as I say, into a dementia process, he's going to get worse. And that is a factor definitely in play, um, that he's going to make these kind of crazy statements with bloodbaths and all that more and more and more. And, and the number of people in the base who respond to him will shrink. And the number of people at the periphery, the independents and the more liberal people will understand this guy's nutcakes. And, and I think that's highly, a factor. And it's highly ironic that he's the one attacking Biden for his supposed age-related, because he, you know, Trump is far worse. Biden has actually gotten stuff done. Let's stop talking about his age and talk about what he's done. Yeah, that's a good point, Louise. Uh, it's classic projection. Donald Trump does it all the time. Uh, that which he's guilty of, he accuses no, others exactly. of doing to deflect yes. the fact that he's doing it. <laughs> so... Good point. Excellent point. Hey, I want to thank you, Jay, for uh, joining us. Thank you for your sage comments. Louise, I want to thank you for your insightful comments and, and really making this topic um, a really beneficial for our listening audience. I'm Tim Apicella with American Issues Take One. And if you like this program, please uh, check donate or, or follow us. Uh, we'd like to do these thoughtful topics, and we hope we generate some thoughts within yourself. And until then, next week, aloha. liked this show, why don't you give us a like or subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much.